Part two is very different than part one. At the end of part one, I asked the question about what is the culture of memory? How do we recall, how do how we preserve, how do we broadcast memories of the flu pandemic of 1918, 1919? Frankly, it doesn't seem very much. There were some 16 to 20 million casualties, fatalities of World War One. About two-fifths of those who died in a few weeks or months from the influenza. And yet, in this relationship, we do not have the corresponding numbers of memorials or of plaques or of plays or literature or music as we do about World War I and, of course, not at all like we have for World War II. So the question becomes, why don't we remember more fully, more often, more in depth, those who fell victim to the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919? Why is that? There are lots of things we could say about that, but what we're doing in this project is we now in part two wish to commemorate some of those who both had the flu and survived it, but especially those who contracted the virus and perished from it. So first we'll begin with those who survived it. The world will be a very different place if those who hadn't survived had not survived it. Right from the get-go, we think about Kaiser Wilhelm II von Hohenzollern. If the German Kaiser who had the flu had perished from it, it probably would have meant the end of the war, which would have saved hundreds of thousands of more lives. But other leaders of the war on the Western side, the Allied side, David Lloyd George of England had the flu, survived it. President Woodrow Wilson, it left him severely handicapped and disabled from having been so ill, but he did survive it. What if he'd not? Almost as a harbinger for the next World War, again, Franklin Delano Roosevelt contracted the flu as well. Winston Churchill's young bride, Clementine Churchill, had the flu and survived it in World War II. She was a major influence in his life, and people say that without her, his leadership of World War II would have been very different. Father afield in New Zealand, young Peter Fraser, advocated overturning the law of conscription and was arrested for this in New Zealand. And ironically, a generation later, by World War II, he was the Prime Minister of New Zealand and oversaw the carrying out of conscription for the Second World War. But in the First World War, he was an opponent of it. General John Joseph Pershing, the American forces, was a great leading force in the American armed services. He, like Ernst Röhm, survived the flu. And of course, if either of them had perished from it, world history would have turned out much differently. Mahatma Gandhi was deathly ill, but survived. as did Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia and the spiritual leader of Rastafarian religious adherents. The German Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin survived the flu to go on to become and to be a leading light in the philosophical world of Western Europe and the United States. For example, analyzing Paul Klee's art. And yet he himself would fall victim to catastrophe later, 
having to flee the Nazis. Who would have done him in, most surely? Amelita Gali Gucci, famous Italian opera singer. Survived about the flu. some of the leading ladies of Hollywood, the early silent film era of Hollywood. Lillian Gish, who starred in Griffin's films about the Ku Klux Klan, Birth of a Nation, as well as the anti-German World War I propaganda film. Young Mary Pickford survived the flu to remain an actress in early Hollywood and also a producer director. And of course, what would the world be like had Greta Garbo not survived the flu? The American leading uh, female painter George O'Keefe was transformed by her experience of the flu, and that is visible in her art itself pre-flu and post-flu. And speaking of art, Eduard Munch, the Norwegian painter, who also spent time in Germany, in the province where I live, Turingen. He was the painter at the Scream, one of the most expensive paintings ever sold in world history. And of course, one more survivor of the flu affected all our lives. My childhood would have been a lot different without him had he not survived. And that would be, of course, Walt Disney. He is, by the way, 16 at the time. He lied about his age and was in World War I as a minor. The only known major literary work is that of Catherine Ann Porter, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, about her experience of having had the flu and having lost her soldier lover. In the future, detective writer Raymond Chandler survived the flu. Another writer who had the flu but did not die from it was Robert Graves in Britain. What's interesting is that he actually met a future lover, Siegfried Sasson, as both were laying in hospital recuperating. It should be noted here that all those millions of losses of soldiers and civilians in World War I, then followed by almost the end of the war by this huge loss of life worldwide, was really the end of an era. It was an era marked by loss, not just of human lives, but also of the world order that had existed before. World War I marked the end of the Hohenzollern, the German imperial family regime, the Romanovs in Russia when the Bolsheviks took over, the Habsburgs in Austria after centuries of rule throughout Europe. Um, institutions in Britain and France were weakened and changed. The colonial status quo of the British Empire, the French Empire, all was brought into question and all began to, quack, uh, to crack and to wave. In this unstable and swiftly changing atmosphere, people like Robert Graves, a writer, was wading into new territory when bisexuality and homoerotic love were given a chance to be expressed, which of course before the war would have been thought of. Literature, of course, in any age, under any circumstances, reflects the culture in which the people are writing. Franz Kafka also experienced firsthand being ill with the flu. His writing perhaps reflected that. This um, collection includes the Die Verwandlung, the transformation or the catharsis, and indeed 
as I just said, in World War I, the whole Western civilization was undergoing a transformation, much of which caused by the loss of all these people and the war itself. And we take time to remember those who had the flu and perished from it. What a different world we'd have today if they'd not died, but it survived. As a transition, we go from one royal, a German-born queen of Denmark, Alexandrina von Mecklenburg-Schwerin, who did survive her bout of flu, and yet her counterpart in Sweden, the young, taxed prince, Eric, Duke of Westmanland, did not survive the flu. In Britain, one of the members of Parliament, Sir Charles Norris Nicholson, perished from the flu. And across the ocean in Boston, the former US representative and at the time Boston postmaster, William Francis Murray, died of the flu as well. If we look to leading heads, both sort of the American royal family, American aristocracy, we have to look at the Hearst family. There was Phoebe Hearst, picture in front of her mansion in Washington, D.C., of course, the mother of the infamous William Randolph Hearst. The Hearst family had made their fortune buying up and cultivating dozens of papers, and at one point they said they had more than 20 million readers. William Randolph Hearst, of course, was not without his detractors, as seen in this cartoon. Kind of another um, American aristocratic family, if one will, would be this family that everyone knows. Perhaps you recognize the little boy on the right who later grew up to be a rich businessman in New York. If you don't know him, you certainly know his son, the grandson of Frederick Trump, who died in 1918 from the Spanish influenza, so-called. Another businessman who was related, who was related to the Whitney family, what a Dickerman Strait. Traveled the world. He was a great adventurer. Visiting many foreign countries, living abroad, serving in various posts, going on trips with others from the United States. Here he is, second from the right. And by the time of World War I, he served the US military, but also died of the flu. Perhaps he went through Egypt on one of his trips. If he had, he might have rubbed shoulders with one of the first Arab feminists, also victim of the flu, Malik Hifni Nasif. One American general, Lyman Walter Bear Cannon, had a very ambivalent record. He'd been involved in the Spanish-American War, his own father in the Civil War, but it was his role in the Spanish-American War, both in Cuba and in the Philippines, that left him with a rather checkered and complicated legacy. For example, as this Spanish paper claimed that Uncle Sam, through the Spanish-American War, was extending its control in what had been Spanish-speaking possessions. British officer Mark Sykes died and took the unprecedented step of actually building a memorial to himself before he had died. Whereas the American officer Charles Augustus Doyen posthumously was awarded with this. He was the first American to receive this special badge of honor. There were other military figures, for example, the British sailor Albert Edward Mackenzie and the Australian soldier George Raymond Dallas Moore, who were awarded the Victoria Cross. This was reserved for men who showed particular bravery. For example, the British 
pilot, Alan Arnett McLeod, and the Canadian, Leif Robinson. These men, too, were awarded distinctions for their bravery during time of war. A man on our list who perished of the flu, who was not particularly brave, or at least wasn't rewarded for it, was Anton Dilger. His father, too, had fought in the Civil War. He was a German-American who, as a young man, went back to Germany, had studied and become a doctor. And during World War I, was in the United States as an agent. He was actually here on a mission to poison American horses and mules. Um, we supplied the Allies with 750,000 horses and mules for the war effort, and his job was to try to poison the supplies before they left North America to be shipped to Britain and to the French front. He later died in Spain, running the, from the authorities, and ironically died of the flu himself. Two early pioneers of aviation were the brothers Moran in France and Leon died of the flu. As did the Dodge brothers, the founders of the later Dodge Automobile Empire, John Francis Dodge and Horace Elgin Dodge. That's their mausoleum, their shared mausoleum in the background. And if they had not created their auto empire, the war would have taken a very different course and did. And while we're speaking about inventors and technicians, we have the inventor of the rather unusual device by Henry Gabriel Ginaka, and that is the automatic peeler and core of pineapples, and that was commissioned by James Dole, who wanted to solve a dogged problem. And this man found one. Another American who utilized technology to solve a problem was this botanist, friend of plants, George Francis, Francis Atkinson, who used the latest camera technology to take groundbreaking photographs of mushroom life, some of which he published in his book. César Ritz, the founder of the hotel chain in Paris, London, and elsewhere, died of the flu, as did the Slovenian author Ivan Kankar. He had published Erotica, as well as other titles, and was Slovenia's leading literary figure. The next picture might be bracing for some. It's Kankar on his deathbed, presumably already deceased. Myrtle Gonzalez was a leading female actor in early Hollywood, starring in numerous silent films. And John uh, Harold Lockwood was also another early star of Hollywood. For various reasons, Hollywood actors were decimated by the flu. They tended to be young. They lived in a relatively large urban area that was very mobile, with lots of people coming and going. So, of course, the virus could travel very quickly and freely with all that comes and going. Plus, again, the people themselves tend to be young, not older people. Louise Vail perished from the flu, as did film producer director John H. Collins. Here's shown with his wife on this poster, Viola Dana. She survived that loss. Here he is on the right, um, working as director for a film that his wife is in with another man. And of course, we have the British-born director, Walter Stradlin. He's shown here directing Mary Pickford in a film. He perished from the flu as well. British-born Julian Lestrange, born Boyle, Julian Boyle, was also in early Hollywood productions such as this of Anthony and Cleopatra, the third, or the second man from the right, and New Yorker Waylon Trusk Jr. was also a frequent face seen in early Hollywood films. Then we have the producer-director Joseph Kaufman, 
who also starred in early films. Speaking of entertainment, the Barman and Bailey star for of many decades, Admiral Dot, Perish from the Flu, as did the Irish dancer Hetty Kelly. She was one of the great loves of Charlie Chaplin's life. Sadly, because of the estrangement, he didn't know for three until three years after her death that she perished of the flu. In a similar way, the Canadian British literary figure Robbie Ross was the great love of Oscar Wilde. Robbie Ross also perished to the flu. Felix Arndt was the American composer. early ragtime. There were other composers, for example, this Portuguese composer Antonio Fragasso, who composed something very different. Sir Perry composed more chorale pieces, a very different genre. In the world of visual arts, Coleman Moser, an Austrian painter, both of oil and an artist of cut glass, for example, of this church window in Vienna. perished, and the European Union used his motif as one of the sides of its 100 euro coin, gold coin. That was recently, but already in his lifetime, Moser's art was used as that of bills in then Habsburg, the Habsburg Empire. Another Austrian subject, who's well known if not by name, his art is certainly known throughout the world. And that of course is the art of Gustav Klimt. One of Klimt's students who later departed from that school and did more experimental art, also perished from the flu, Egon Schiele. And sadly, so did his wife, Edith Schiele. Before the world lost both of them, he painted numerous motifs, always more and more experimental and avant-garde, for which he's remembered, remembered today. Here's the pair. Uh, before they became ill, she died three days before he, pregnant with their six-month um, fetus. And then he died his Egon Schiele in, in the act of dying, and ironically, he even painted while sick after she died, and he himself left this world. Another figure from the Habsburg Empire, the Czech Bohumil Kubišta, also left great potential when he perished to the flu. Um, 
work that was begun but not finished. Here is a self-portrait from all over his paintings show his distinct interpretation of his subjects. The American painter Morton Livingston Schomburg experimented with form and color, as did the Catalonian painter Luisa Vidal y Puig, shown here in her apartment studio with samples of her own painting. The Mexican artist Saturno Herran Gunchar experimented with early muralist techniques using innovative shades of color and paint strokes to capture the Mexican spirit. The Portuguese painter Amadeo de Souza Cardoso was also very experimental. And while he's been lost to the world, what remains of his art continues to fascinate our critics for its innovative and creative use of form and color. And the British painter Harold Gilman also recorded the world through his rather unusual eye for color, light, form. The Danish Astronomer Hans Emil Lau moved to Germany early on in his career. In fact, he got a position at the Venerable Observatory in Berlin in Treptow. And even using what would now be rather primitive technology and techniques, succeeded in exploring and recording much of Jupiter's surface conditions and even topography. In fact, there are landforms in Jupiter named for him. The German sociologist Max Weber was a leader of political thought. His mind, too, was laid waste by the flu. Speaking of philosophy and the science of the mind, Sigmund Freud's daughter, Sophia Halberstadt Freud, perished from the flu. which was a great loss for him. The town of Östersund in Sweden was particularly hit hard by the flu, and many argue that one of the reasons the Swedish healthcare system is so strong today was that this near collapse of the health system in provincial Sweden uh, informed the Swedes of their need for better health care. Indeed, many Swedes, Norwegians, Danes died, including the Norwegian-Swedish architect Jordis Grontov Ragnarud. She was awarded for her innovative architectural styles. And there was Hugo Levin, the Swedish soccer player, but who also 
was involved in promoting the building of stadiums like that in Göteborg. Speaking of civic betterment, Denver's Mayor Robert Walter Speer was an adherent of the City Beautiful movement, and indeed on his clock, as he was mayor of the Mile High City, Denver undertook large building projects to transform a former westward cow town into a capital city, one that even today continues to become a nice, nicer place to live. In the southeast, over 13,000 North Carolinians lost their lives to the flu, one of whom was the president of the University of North Carolina, Edward Kidder Graham. He had taken over the leadership of the college, occupying its presidential house and its presidential office as an effective administrator, but it was his social policy that helped transform the school. For example, already alluded to in his articles and speeches when he soon took office. Yes, he always saw what every American college has to support the sports programs, but he was particularly interested in the academic life, and it was on his clock that the first female was admitted to the medicine program at the college, although her male classmates voted against her entry. Led by their university president, the staff of the university voted to accept her, and indeed, there's a photo of the first female medical student at the University of North Carolina. Another pioneer in education in America was Ella Flagg Young, even though she only began school herself at the age of 10. At the age of 15, she was doing college-level work, and then became a leading pedagogue and the superintendent of the Chicago School Board School District. Nellie Erickson was a Danish-descended British painter who excelled in agrarian and home life motifs. While she was doing that, a woman she would in the, in the, uh, know well in the future, Rose Cleveland, the younger sister of President Grover Cleveland, played first lady for over a year in the White House while her bachelor brother was undertaking the business of the federal government. Around the same time, Nellie Erickson found herself in Italy increasingly fascinated by Italian motifs. And as she pursued her own art career, she decided to retire in Bagnia de Luca. At some point, she made the acquaintance of two American women who would forever change her life. That would be Rose Cleveland on the right and Evangeline Whipple on the left. Interestingly, the two women had met before in the 1890s, and yet Evangeline later married Bishop Whipple and moved with him to Minnesota, where she became active on the reservations, attending to the needs of Native Americans. And after his death, she and Rose got back together, and the two women spent the rest of their lives now living with Nellie Erickson in Italy. The three still are together in the cemetery, Evangeline and Rose, marked by identical tombstones, and Nelly nearby. The British Union activist and writer, Stephen Reynolds, moved to Sidmouth in Devon. He was interested in the life of fishermen, although very few gay men normally gravitate to such interest. And speaking of another gay man at the time who lived openly, Charles Thomason Giffis also frequented the Lafayette bathhouse where he made contacts both professionally and elsewise. Speaking of men coming together in large numbers, the Australian rugby player Jack Bonnet fell to the flu, as in the American football star at the University of Virginia, Eugene Meyer. The 
sox star Larry Chappelle was one of eight major league baseball players in the United States who died or was killed in service during World War I. The Ottawa Senators star Hamby Shore died at an early age of influenza. As did the soccer manager Dan McMichael of Scotland. The French runner Henry Taussin perished from the flu, as did the French bicyclist Georges Paré. The American boxer Batlin Jim Johnson contracted the flu and died as well. Here's his passport photo. Um, more than once, he fought in major matches, also in Paris, and despite being um, an athlete, succumbed to this unseen killer. The father of modern surfing, Hawaiian-born Californian George Freed, also succumbed, but not before he was able to popularize surfing on the West Coast and elsewhere. He was awarded or commemorated for being a lifeguard, and he w was really key in upgrading the role of lifeguarding in public life. And we end this look at some of those who fell to flu by looking at religious takes of his victim's passage. For example, Mario. Lombardo could not overcome his grieving, the loss of his eight-year-old daughter, Rosalio, and indeed had her embalmed and placed, or the last bodies to be placed, in the catacombs of Palermo, and to this day, her little coffin sits in an airtight container. The Portuguese siblings Francisco and Jacinta Marto claimed that they foresaw the coming of the flu pandemic and they're with their own deaths. And they, as well as a friend, were immortalized. In stone, the friend survived. They both perished, only to be later beatified and announced saints. And finally, we look to the Native American Redbird Smith, a member of the Cherokee Nation in southeastern United States. He was a leader of his people. And so we leave this survey of victims of the flu with quotes from Native Americans about death and life. Thank you for watching a memorial to those who had the flu but survived it or those who perished from it. And we hope that you yourself will think about how would the world be different if those folks had had a different fate. Thank you.